Okay, good morning and welcome to our Eid of Shabbat Parashah class, Parashiot class, Parashiot Matot Mat'eh. Two Parashiot to end the book of the Midbar. Tribal leaders and vows. That's what we're faced with. The double Parashah structure of this Shabbat has many topics, many interesting topics. But the first one that we're faced with right in the beginning of Parashat Matot is a very interesting one. Truthfully, it's just a set of laws. Just. It's a set of laws. A set of laws regarding the Darim. One, specifically in this parasha, a woman who has taken vows upon her and the possible annulment of those vows by her husband when she's married, by her father when she is single and combinations of the two and other scenarios. Why is that so interesting? Besides the critical nature of having any set of laws in the Torah, because of the way it's presented to us right in the beginning in the first pasuk of the parasha. We are in Parashat Matot Perek Lamed, chapter 30. Actually, the parasha does not start from Pasuk Aleph, starts from Pasuk Bet. And let's read it together. And let's see what this is all about, what difficulties we may discover, and what incredible lessons we may be able to glean from this first pasuk. By Daber Moshe or Hamatot, the Bnei Israel Lemor. And Moshe spoke to the leaders of the Matot. Matel literally means a staff, but it doesn't literally saying the leaders of staffs wouldn't make sense. It's referring to the tribal leaders, the Nisi'im who each had a, uh, not just because the leader would hold someone of prestige would have a staff in those days, which is true, but also because they were in charge of the digalim, the banners that represented each tribe. Obviously, they'd be held by some type of staff or stick. And that's why they're called Rashe Hamatot, the leaders of the staffs. It's referring to the Nisi'im, the tribal leaders who had a number of functions. And here it says, Moshe spoke to the tribal leaders, to B'nai Israel lemor, saying, This is what, this is the thing, this is the idea, this is the command that Hashem put forth. And then we'll just read one more pasuk, Gimal, as the, as the beginning of the presentation of this set of laws of Nedarim. Says when a man uh, either makes a vow or takes an oath or makes a swear to forbid him for uh, forbid something upon himself to prohibit uh, himself against something or. Um, to not allow himself to engage in pleasure from something. His word cannot be in vain, let's say for argument's sake. Rather, he has to keep, he has to follow, he has to observe everything that exited his mouth, meaning that he has to remain true to his nidah. Okay, let's backtrack. All right, first of all, well, what happened by Daber Adonai al Moshe Lemot? Now, we know that all the Mizvot, by and large, were given the Hadis Sinai. There were some that played out circumstantially in the desert, but otherwise, they're given to Moshe Rabbeinu from Akhadus Baruchu on Hadis Sinai. And yet, some of them, many of them, were not revealed to us for whatever reasons until a little bit later in the Torah. Sometimes it's circumstantial. And sometimes they just fit well in the context of where Kadosh Baruch Hu placed them in the Torah. So our first question would be, why are the laws of Nidarim, of vows, placed here? Last week's parasha, Pinehas, ended with the korbanot of the holidays and the special days. And what follows in our parasha, in parashiot, are certain events. The next would be the war of Midian, the war of revenge of Am Yisrael against Midian. Why is the parashah Nadarim spoken here? Now, we know that Hashem commanded this to Moshe, but usually we're told that. There are some times in the Torah where Moshe just comes out and speaks to B'nai Israel. We assume that there was obviously uh, a command which preceded 
Moshe Rabbeinu's initiative. But here, it's super unusual. Here, it's by Daber Moshe, not only are we skipping God's communication to Moshe, but we're also now not uh, witnessing Moshe's presentation to Am Yisrael at all or somewhat. Rather, the only time in the Torah that we see this is Moshe addresses the tribal leaders. Why? Only, first, what do they have to do with Nedarim? Where do they come in over here? And then, says the Bnei Israel, make up your mind. And then Lemoa saying, well, who's Bnei Israel supposed to convey this to? There's no one left. What does that mean? Moshe chooses to speak initiative, right? God commanded them to him, taking the initiative now, and he decides to convey these laws to the tribal leaders. And then it says, Libne Israel, who's calling Bnei Israel? And then it says, saying, as if there's someone left to communicate this law to. And then it says, Zehadavar, this is what God commanded you. Uh, and then the forthcoming Pesukim. Very highly unusual, peculiar beginning. And Parashiyot always begin in the first Pasuk with something that's enigmatic, ambiguous, um, that's supposed to be end up being super eye-opening uh, because we're forced to dig down deep. But this structure is certainly a one that is unmatched in the rest of the parashiot of the Torah. And what I thought to do is put forth, there are a number of theories, but put forth those theories from which we get peripheral benefit and are able to perhaps extrapolate from them messages that are out of context, not necessarily about the parasha and the darim, but other types of messages. And I'll show you what I mean. First off, Rashi. Let's go for, no further than Rashi. Rashi reminds us of something uh, that is eye-opening, but shouldn't be. And that is that this happened in every single Mizvah. What does that mean? means that there was communication to leaders prior to Am Yisrael. Now, I'll address that in a moment. Okay, fine, says Rashi. Well, if that's the case, so either tell that to us in every Mizvah or don't tell it to us here. Why specifically here? Are we reminded of that? And Rashi tells a, uh, speaks of a halachic uniqueness of the Mizvah or Mizvot of Nedarim, and that is that a neder can be annulled, hatarat nedarim, can be allowed, so to speak, undone. Alpi mumhe yahid, even without the convening of a beddin of three, but even with one single hacham, who is an expert, who is a high authority in these matters, or in general, he can perform hatarat nedarim. And therefore, sheha matot, represent the leaders, it is appropriate in this juncture to remind us that Moshe Hashem and then Moshe convey laws first to leaders and then to Am Yisrael, mention the leaders here, the leaders are playing a special role in the laws of the Darim. Now, that forces us to reflect upon a truism in history. And that is, and we're taught this by Rambam in his introduction to Mishnayot, and he gives us a little bit of a different scenario. He tells us that Moshe descends from Haris Yenai. He goes to Ohel Mu'ed, and he first has a private meeting with Aharon. Conveys everything he heard, Torah Shebekhtav and Torah Shebe'apeh, to Aharon. Um, Aharon steps aside, remains there. Aharon's children then enter, and he then conveys, and of course, he had four children at the time, Nadav, Avi, Azar, Tamar, and Moshe educates Moshe's sons the next in spiritual, Aaron's son, sorry, the next in spiritual command of the entire Torah. They step aside, they remain, and they're listening. Of course, Aaron was listening to uh, tutorial number two. And, uh, and of course, now the sons will be there for the next one. Now, according to the Rambam, it wasn't the leaders of the tribes, but it was the 70 Zechanim, 70 elders in Hachanim that next entered and heard the, the lecture of the entire Torah from Moshe Rabbeinu uh, with, in the presence of Aaron and his sons, 
they step aside and then it's taught to the rest of the nation. So Moshe Rabbeinu therefore teaches the Torah in this historical incredible time of ours four times, four, four times. Um, and that, and of course the others heard then the Rabbah goes on to speak out that the others then teach them again. But I don't want to play out the entire protocol, rather just mention from this, this is why Hachamim suggests that when we study Torah, we should review, we should learn at least four times, which means we should review at least three times every time we study Torah, because that's the way it was done in Shi'ur number one in Jewish history. Of course, Shi'ur number one was quite lengthy. It was Koha Torah Kula. But that is a wonderful peripheral message that we glean from Rashi's solution to partial solution to our problems over here. Let's go to the Rashbam, the great Rashbam, who happens to be the grandson of Rashi. And Rashbam puts us into context, as do a number of other commentators, and reminds us, where are we right now in the Torah? The last we left off was Parashat Pinehas, and the uh, elaboration and articulation of all of the Korbanot obligations for Shabbat or Chodesh and the holidays thoroughly. In fact, we quote from them every single holiday in Rosh Chodesh from, from Parashat Pinehas. And at the end, the second to last Pasuk of the Parasha, which is Perek Kaftet Pasuk Lamertet, Ela Ta'asu Ladonai B'mo'adechem. This is what you should offer to Hashem on your holidays. Besides what you're already obligated to Hashem from your nidrechem, nidbotechem, your nidarim, and your nidabot. And we are, uh, which means what? Which means that sometimes individuals from Ayim Yisrael donate korbanot, so to speak. Sometimes it's in the form of a neder. A neder is when you take an animal designated and you say, not a specific animal, you say, an animal is upon me. A, a cow or bullock is upon me for a korban ola. I take it upon me. That's called a neder. Nedaba is when I point to a specific one and I say, this one is um, uh, an obligation of mine right now and I'm taking it upon me for a korban ola or the like. And there are differences between Nedarim and Nedavot. Explains to us the Rashbam, well then of course the next segment of Torah should talk about Nedarim and Nedavot, and specifically Nedarim, and, and, and therefore the advent of the series of laws regarding Nedarim, and who should be addressed, says the Rashbam. Well, we know that there is a prohibition called Baal Te'ahed, Later in Parashat, it says, uh, One may not uh, delay paying any time he has a neder. There was talking about a korban, but any neder that applies to, there's five opinions in the Gemara as to what uh, constitutes delaying and the Yisur, what we call Baal Te'ahed. And the law is three regalim that pass not in order wherever you are in that moment of the year. Three regalim later, Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot, um, you'll be violating Baal Te'ahed if you don't bring that Korban or uh, uh, own up to whatever neder, whatever vow that you made. Says the Rashbam, well, Moshe immediately after realizing that, oh, all these nedarim and nedavot, they can violate easily Baal Ta'ahed. This is upon the leaders to make sure to uh, keep the people on track with bringing their nedarim and nedavot korbanot. And now while I'm talking about that, let's talk about individual nedarim that not necessarily connected to korbanot. And let's tell the leaders, be the ones, because you're involved in the process, to make sure that every person keeps to his uh, nedarim, as the next pasuk says, and is very, is very scrupulous, is very um, motivated, is very responsible, is accountable for all his nedarim. That is something 
that the onus is on the leaders. Of course, individuals will be accountable as well. The onus is on the leaders to keep the people in check. And that's why this is not only following, starting Matot, which follow the end of Pinehas, uh, but also well, who's being addressed, Rashi HaMatot. And also reminds us, by the way, whoever learned Nidarim, Masech Nidarim, Mishnayot Gemara, remembers that when a person uh, takes a vow and specifically prohibits some thing, some person, some food, some activity onto himself, the language, uh, which is the most conventional language is, this is asur alai ke korban. This is prohibited upon me like a korban, like sanctified meat of a korban, I have limitations and how I engage in it. And reminds us, therefore, of the connection between nidarim and korbanot and regular nidarim, because the language used for regular nidarim, prohibiting something upon oneself, is like a korban, so to speak. So there's a very close tie between the end of Pinehas and the beginning of Matot, and especially appropriate to be addressing the leaders of the tribe. Let's move on to the Ramban. And the Ramban, aided by the Or HaChayim, speaks to us about who to present certain laws in Torah to. Now, there is a very interesting Mishnah in Masechet Hagiga that speaks about Nedarim. And it says specifically regarding Heter Nedarim. Now, I mentioned that a Hakam can release a vow, a null a vow really more like releasing, because the annulment comes from the topic matter in our parasha, which is fathers and husbands. Really, there is no mention in this parasha, nor anywhere in the Torah, regarding releasing of a vow by a, an expert hacham, by an authority. And the Mishnah Masechet Hagiga says, hatara nedarim, or heter nedarim, purhim ba'avir. They're floating in the air, says the Mishnah, allow, uh, neder allowance, and they have nothing to rely upon, which means that these are laws from Torah Shebe'alpeh, and they may even be categorized as halachal Moshe Mishinai, they're oral law, and they have almost nothing to rely upon in the text of Torah Shebe'alpeh, they're hanging on by a thread, so to speak. They're floating in the air because in the hand of we don't see actual text that can be the starting point and the support for and the source of the laws specifically of hatarat nedarim of um, by hachamim to individuals. And because of that, and because of the fact that there is some, and why is that, by the way? Let's ask ourselves, why is that? Tell us in the Torah, Kedoshah. Of course, we could ask that about other misbots that are called Torah, Halakha, Moshe, Messianai. But here specifically, we're asking this question. The answer is, tells us that I'm bad and others, because this is something that is very serious. And were your average citizen to know that there are very doable, realistic uh, means um, through which one can uh, engage in order to release himself from Nidarim, you could imagine how one may take Nidarim lightly. You could imagine how one uh, may not be very fervent and observant people when it comes to Nidarim and allow uh, irresponsibly, lightly, um, without uh, advanced thought, Nidarim to exit his mouth, to make vows. We say in Arabic, Haki Balash, just to go ahead and say it. That would be disastrous. And therefore, Moshe Rabenu made a decision. He called it. And he said, Moshe el I'm going to reveal this set of laws to the leaders only. Yes, tell the rest of the people about how a father and a husband, depending on the situation, can annul a vow. But in terms of this hataran deriva hacham, your local, you know, authoritative, knowledgeable rabbi, no, I'm not going to inform them. I'm going to speak to Rashi Hamatot, and when necessary, the leaders will inform that to the people. 
depending on the situation. And says the Ora Haim, I can prove that from the Pasu. By the bear, and now it solves one of our problems. By the bear Moshe al Rasheham Matot, he spoke to the leaders, Libne Israel Lemor. To Bnei Israel, saying, saying what? Saying, Adunai. In other words, to Bnei Israel, I chose only to convey the laws that are stated in the text of the written law of our parasha. But Moshe Rabbeinu did what we called a hora'ah, a call, took a shot, not took a shot, uh, you know, he's the one that made the call over here, and he decided on his own that this is not to be conveyed to specifically the less educated. And here we're introduced to a fascinating concept. And that is that the Torah Kedosha sometimes has to be packaged. It has to be framed. There are modes and realms of Torah that are not even to be revealed. You don't teach a first grader Zohar. You don't teach a three-year-old, yet the laws of Nida, right? You don't even start Hakanim tell us teaching Gemara to a certain age. There are deeper concepts that you don't teach in public. And so on and so forth, a subjective judgment must be used by a teacher and a guide and a rabbi and a husband, etc., and a father as to what to teach to whom? And when you teach it, it has to be framed correctly, accurately, and not only that, in a manner which fits the student, not just for him to learn it and absorb it correctly, but also to make sure that that student is not misled, perhaps, because of the depth of or because of the lack of understanding and being able to contextualize a specific law and put it in its proper place and do the right thing with the law, and be responsible with it. And therefore, the Torah is to be taught to everyone, and is there, is there for everyone to learn. However, when teaching and conveying Torah, one must be discriminant, one must be wise, and one must know sometimes to whom to teach, how to teach, how to frame and package words of Torah. Final uh, let's call a solution-oriented theory uh, for our first few Pesukim, but from which we can glean another critical message. I say the Ibn Ezra for the last. Ibn Ezra says, as he often does, this parasha is out of order, is out of order, and it belongs somewhere else. What does that mean? It means the set of laws of Nidarim over here belong later in the parasha after the Mohammed Midjan, after the war of revenge against Midjan is over. And why is it appropriate there? Because at the end, I'm talking not only at the end of that war of Midjan, subsequent to that war, we know that the Uben tribes of the Uben, God, and half of the tribe of Menashe asked for their um, land to be given to them, their inheritance to be given to them on the eastern side of the Jordan River, not in Eretz Israel proper. After a give and take, Moshe Rabbeinu agreed under certain conditions, and he told them as follows, fine, build cities for yourself over here on the other side of the Jordan River, and stables for your cattle, and etc. What? Exit your mouth, what you said, what you committed to do, to what you gave your word, you must observe and do it and follow up with it. And says Ibn Ezra, that is really where these sets of laws were then introduced to Amistel right away. Do you see what I just committed to Ruben God Ben to do? I want to tell you something right now. This law is called Nadarim. And the overriding principle is that a person, not just a tribe, not just a leader, not just something committed to in public, but in every context of life, 
every word that's spoken, in every situation, in every setting. A person must keep to his word. Later in Parashat, at the end of Devarim, the only other place that speaks about Nidarim, and I referenced it before, it says the following about Nidarim. Mosa sefatecha tishmor ve'asita. Again, Mosa, what exit your lips, keep. What distinguishes us as human beings from all other creations of HaKadosh Baruch Hu in this universe is the power of intellect and communication. What distinguishes us as Am Yisrael from all other nations is the sanctification of that communication, of the fact that we communicate to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that we study Torah, that we verbalize the Kiddushat Olam that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has granted us. When words exit these holy lips, lo yachel devaro, don't create a halul Hashem according to some interpretations, what that means. Rather, keep and mimic the ways of God, keep to every word that you say, follow up with every commitment that you make, it means you have to recall them. It means you can't take them lightly. It means they have to be said discriminately and with foresight. Think before you talk, because once it, once it comes out, that is a word you're married to until it's followed through. Call how you say me, not just nedarim, everything that exits your mouth. That's what he told in front of all of Am Yisrael in public, the two and a half tribes. And then that's what he told Am Yisrael, the leaders of Am Yisrael, to tell Am Yisrael about nedarim and all other words which exit our mouth. Be careful, keep your word. This is the wonderful first pasuk in this parasha, which explodes with different critical principles uh, of Torah and Mizvot and um, and a relationship to Baruch Hu. Baruch Amen. Amen. Shabbat Shabbat.